it just brought back a lot to me. And he's talked about how much it's bring back, brought back to him um, recently. But these are, you know, this is this time of year too. It's an emotional time. So again, I'm grateful for you for things that didn't even have to do with it. Bruce and I share a Nebraska heritage. Though my parents met in New York City, both of them had deep roots in Nebraska. They left here, they left actually some in New Jersey, um, with a baby. They left not in a covered wagon, but in a Chevy. This was after my father inherited his own homestead. The story of Jenny touches me as I think of my own artistic and creative mother leaving this area to move to the flat farmland of eastern Nebraska. This woman eventually went back to school for a doctorate in history, and with my father, she toured the state lecturing on the beauty and the spirituality of Nebraska quilt, quilts and quilt making. On her side, I'm descended from a prairie missionary and an early state senator. On my father's side, there was a great-grandmother born in the Saw Shanty, and an original farm, which was awarded a 100 years homestead honor by the state. Now this honor was held at the York County Rodeo, and sadly, the award was not handed out by a rodeo clown, which I would have liked very much. I speak of my family tonight because Bruce's book is a deeply personal testament to creativity, family, and strength. It demonstrates that art finds its so I focus on Nebraska, the words touch us all as we find ourselves remembering and honoring our own pioneers. So before I turn to Bruce and Jenny, I'd like a little bit to set a stage for the 19th and 20th century of Nebraska. And I'm going to do something that my dear friend Sandra has never seen. I'm going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Barren, barren place, and the people who went out there. And you know, we would think about farmland. Any other Midwesterners in here could get this? Oh, yeah, okay. We think about rolling hills. This was not the case. So, in honor of, Robert, of Roger Walsh and many others, I'm going to sing for you. On Nebraska land, sweet Nebraska land, upon the burning soil I stand. I look away across the plains and wonder why it never rains. On oh, Nebraska land, sweet Nebraska land, on my burning soil I stand. We do not live, we only stay, because we're too poor to move away. <laughs> Museum show of her work, and most likely, 
her first one-woman show of any kind. And now to Bruce, my friend and pioneer. Nebraska native, Bruce is committed to poetry since his retirement from the nonprofit world of theater in 2020. His work has been anthologized in American Graveyard, and I Just Want to Be Loved by You, Poems on Marilyn Monroe, edited by Margot Taft Sever, Sever? Sever. Sever. and Susanna H. Case, who might be here. Is she here? There she is. Okay. Good applause. <laughs> been published in numerous journals and magazines. The Elf and the Blade is his first collection. Poets Were Prada, which is one of my favorite titles, will publish his new collection, Good House Could Be Next Year. Now, Bruce's bio left out an entire world before poetry. And uh, I just want to say that it's a varied and global history, and that includes tireless work for the American Regional Theater. So I'm throwing that in because I'm the boss right now. <laughs> You're in for a treat. It's wonderful to be here. Please welcome Bruce. So thank you, Cindy. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. All right, good. So thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. It's great to see you all, and I want to welcome Buddhists, poets, Nebraskans, the whole community. And as Cindy said, it's really cool that we're here at the Willie Cather Community Room because not only every Nebraska writer has to think about her, or any writer actually, but because Jenny and Willa share a history on the Great Plains. They were on the Great Plains at the same time, the 1880s and 1890s. So I've been writing this book basically all my life. After Jenny told me these stories, I would run home and write them down, determined to be the first 10-year-old to write a story. <laughs> <laughs> my first play was drawn from the story of one of her daughters, my great-aunt Ruth, about a lynching during a wheat harvest. I returned to poetry. My friend uh, Lynn McGee heard Christmas oranges and suggested I continue to explore Jenny's life, and so I have. At about the same time, Tom Gallagher, who's here, the president of the Museum of Nebraska Arts, among other wonderful positions in Nebraska, um, he and I started conversations about putting together a show. Oops, I'm the wrong There we go. I'll stop leaning on the key. Started talking about putting a show of Jenny's paintings together, and as Cindy said in February, the Dawson County Historical Society Museum will put this on. So this book is kind of like a catalog for the show, and it's very much designed to come out at the same time. I want to also, before I go on, acknowledge Roxanne Hoffman, who's here tonight from Poets Wear Prada. I think um, not only are they putting out good housekeeping, but they're, she and Jack Cooper published Christmas Oranges in their Rainbow Project. It's the first poem to be published from this collection. And their faith in me really did inspire me to take on this project, knowing that good housekeeping is coming down the line. And every step of the way, Roxanne has been coaching me on how to be a new publisher. So thank you very much, Roxanne. You've done a terrific model. So as I said, the book is a narrative collection of poetry uh, based on stories I heard when I was young. And starting to Jenny was in her 70s. That's just when I was young. This is about what she was like. And so the first poem I'd like to read is Small White House in a Small Town. Small white house in a small town on the high line. Jenny tells how Horace, her father, dug the first well. They came out from Ohio betting on hope. Because father was a carpenter, the Saudi had rare wood frame windows, windows battered hard in 88. Blizzards were a fact of life in Farnham, Moorfield, Curtis, Maywood, and beyond, the small towns of the high line. Left her heart back in Ohio, first her favorite brother, then a lover, returned to Nebraska, the high line. Married old and had three girls, Esther, Dorothy, and Ruth, but it was Ohio where she learned to paint oils. Painted everything that was not Highline. Purple mountains, blue lakes, green trees, elk, lions, sailboats, stones, cottages, nestled, copied from calendars, postcards, magazines, and sold for a few dollars to view-starved farmers and their wives on the brown prairies. She doesn't tell how husband killed farming, not even 60, just as he got off his knees from 29, 
After one farm gone, him dead, last farm sold, she moved into the small white house in the small town. A house too cold for winter, so she migrated among those daughters and their silent husbands, couldn't wait to return across the High Line home to the small white house in the small town each spring and open the studio in the pantry. Smog and paint tubes, canvases, the smell of baking bread and turpentine, a dwindling paradise as friends die off, dumping autumn ashes on the daffodils, daughters getting older, sons-in-law suffer her still, home is the small white house in the small town. Paintings hanging homes across the land in Nebraska Grandma Moses telling tales to children, now almost deaf to their voices. She gazes out the south window, her brown eyes a stain of light, sun sets and splits on the blade of the high line. Farnham, Morfield, Curtis, Maywood and beyond, the small white house in the small town. The High Line, it just is a paper called the High Line Enterprise. And when we used to visit my grandma, we got our name in the social columns. <laughs> <laughs> I always relish my time in print. Right? <laughs> This is a picture of the Sod House where they started in 1885 and the frame house they built after that. And that house is still standing and is still in the family, the frame house. So, um, so next, um, I want to skip ahead. I'm dipping around the book. There are a lot of plot points in the book. It is a coherent narrative, but I don't want to give them all away, so I'm dipping <coughs> around. I'm going to skip ahead to her time in Ohio. And uh, she went back to see her brother Raleigh, but also to chase a guy she met that she thought might be interesting. And that's where she started to paint. And this is the story about that. This is from Cleveland Gallery. Martha took her downtown. She dared the streetcar and found she liked watching people, admiring houses as the train glided down broad avenues of fall foliage. They passed a storefront gallery. There were only a few people viewing paintings from the plain air season. Crest Isle beaches, boats on Lake Erie, dairy cows sinking in mud. Why paint mud, sneered Aunt Martha? Because it's there, said the whiskered man. Jenny. Do you like my pictures? Oh, I don't know. I've never seen one. Oh, Jenny, smarted Martha. Of course you have. Well, with the painter in the room, I mean. Want to try it for yourself? Martha gave the man a glaring take. Yes, I would. Thank you, Jenny said. She was told the North Light was the best. Brushes weren't needles, but good fingers helped just the same. Turpentine and oils pinched her nose, but the color, the color, even mud was sublime if you mixed it right. Nothing was as light as she wanted at first, but soon her touch, the canvas, came alive, landscapes especially. And this is actually her first painting ever. Uh, she could paint now snow on a mountain so cold it burned your nose. You could breathe that pine air. The whiskered man hovered and pointed. She could smell his pomade. She knew there was more to his attention, but she ignored all that. Her starched shirtwaist and the combs in her hair never cracked. Only her fingers took on the day's colors that the weeks unwashable as the glow in her eyes. Robert, her boyfriend, gave her pictures of once over. He wasn't sure. I'll be better with practice, she smiled. Mm, this is taking a lot of time, he mumbled. He caught himself. It's good to see you're making the most of your time here. My time here? She followed him out the door. Mr. Whiskers looked down. So that was the time when she was getting started. Things with Robert didn't work out. And so she came back to Nebraska and uh, was sewing so for a few years. And one day she got a visit from Mrs. Catherine Hicks. Now I want to tell you about the Hicks family, her, her in-laws, the future in-laws. Horatio Hicks, a soldier here, um, was a soldier in the Civil War and wounded there. The sod house next to that is actually the schoolhouse where her husband, Arthur, went to school. He's one of the children in front of it. And the Hickses didn't live in the sod house. They started out in the frame house, and that's their house. And we'll see why in a second. So this is the Elk and the Glade. Arthur, Arthur Hicks, was the son of an odd couple, a wounded Civil War veteran, Horatio, who had been languishing in the D.C. hospital when Lincoln was shot, and Catherine, the belle of a defunct Philadelphia fortune. Her mother's father, Rivka, had come from Austria with a command of machine looms. I've got to show you a family picture. Catherine's in the center there. Arthur is a 
you can see this uh, kind of Philadelphia face there. <laughs> um, her, uh, her, her mother's father, Ritka, had come from Austria with a command of machine looms. He built a cotton mill in the 1830s and got rich. His daughter married into the Whitakers, which is another Whitaker, descendants of British deserters who chopped wood for a living. But in two generations, a Whitaker daughter had married a governor of Pennsylvania. All this glamour ended for Catherine's family with the Civil War. Cotton was embargoed, the mill was closed, the family ruined. They melted their last silver dollars into spoons and blazing with the initial R for Ritka, while Cap which Catherine carried in her Pope Bento all the way to the High Line. The move excited Horatio, who was eager to leave behind stuffy Philadelphia with its own <coughs> after bankruptcy. Catherine, a proper, demanding, sharp-tongued snob, set an elevated tone for the whole family. No sawed house for her. She let Arthur stay indoors and read his books while blizzards howled outside their proper frame house. Her mother's porcelain teacups lined the top shelf, a constant dusting hazard to the succession of Irish hired girls. Catherine's low opinion of Highline girls had kept Arthur single longer than Horatio. <coughs> Arthur taught country school and in summer farmed Horatio's homestead for him. He drove a four-wheel trap and kept to himself. Catherine needed a new dress for the GAR picnic, Grand Army of the Republic. She hated the sentimental, sometimes boozy gallery of veterans, but her garrulous Horatio thrived on company, and the war had been his moment. Even she could not bear to withhold one of his few pleasures. Having heard good things, she called on Jenny, who pumped her singer at Mons, where she boarded. Jenny was one of the few girls in town not afraid of Catherine, who reminded her of one or two hostesses she'd met in Cleveland. Her traveled eye and straightforward manner reassured Catherine. Jenny had been east. Jenny had taste. She recommended a narrower skirt and no petticoats. Catherine would think about it. She was about to leave when her eye caught a picture hanging over the sewing machine. It was an elk in a mountain glade, its majestic anchors pitched back, its mouth opening a maiden call. Where did you get this, Jenny? It's lovely. Catherine's voice rang like a bell. A friend gave it to me. Really? Who? Someone in town? Jenny blushed. No, no, I have to confess, ma'am, I actually painted it myself, just dabbling on my own. Catherine's eyes narrowed. Never sell yourself short, dear. So Jenny got into the uh, family and married Arthur. That's one of my favorite pictures. That's the two of them, about 1905. Um, visiting, it's a Wendy March, but she was always terrified of March, and um, they were visiting one of her brothers. So they went on to have three children. Uh, this is, uh, oops, sorry. This is Jenny. Uh, oh, I see. Let's see if I'm this thing. Yeah, so that's Jenny and Arthur and her three daughters. All three girls play a big part in the book. And we'll get to part of that. But Dorothy, Esther, my paternal grandmother in the middle, and Ruth there on the edge. This is about 1915, I would say, or something a little later. So Esther, um, there's a, a, a kind of an elegy for each of them, but Esther had a special gift. And uh, she married a fellow named Harlan Whitaker, the late right Whitaker, my, my Whitaker now. And uh, they lived in Kearney. And um, so until a certain time, and this is what Cassandra and the Depression, which is a long prose poem about Esther's gifts, uh, is about. Esther married Harlan, the love of her life, and a bright light in Kearney, which is a larger town about 100 miles from Kearney. That's where I grew up. He was a teacher, Boy Scout master. People had their eye on him. Soon they had a baby boy, my father. They were offered a post in Hawaii where teachers were badly needed. Then one day, Harlan was rushed to the hospital with appendicitis. He survived the operation just fine. He was only 28 years old, after all. After a week of bed rest, not allowed to get up at all, he was ready to go home. Esther and Jenny went home to get lunch and were about to return for him when the phone rang. Mother, please get that. It's the hospital and Harlan has died. Jenny had heard these kinds of things from Esther before. She walked to the phone and picked up the earpiece. It was the hospital. Indeed, Harlan was gone. He had sat up after a week flat on his back and pitched over with a stroke. So that was about 1933, just a few months after my dad was born. And um, 
this uh, picture of the three girls at Harney in school. And this is uh, her uh, dad and my grandmother Esther moved back to the farm. And this is Jenny with my dad in about 1933. Uh, who's born in 1932. So um, this brings us to one other picture that I love this picture. This is kind of, I think they helped Esther get over the loss of Harlem. They took a trip down to Galveston. So it's my dad, Arthur, Jenny, and Esther having a little break. And uh, I love that because it's one of the last pictures we have of Arthur, actually. So uh, he was killed in 1938. And uh, from then on, that's when Jenny really started painting seriously. And one of the mysteries in the family was why she didn't paint Nebraska landscapes or things that are in front of her. She always painted images such as this, which is kind of a pro forma Jenny painting. Uh, she painted other kinds of things over time, but this was what she really sold. And uh, my theory is partly in Nebraska, they were just electrifying rural areas at this time. And so what she put on the wall could actually be seen at night when you're home, not working on the farm. So, these kinds of things were very popular, and she, she did a lot of them. But I have a theory about it, which is expressed in a poem called Pink. She puts on an old shirt. She mixes colors on the palette, primary white, turpentine. She chooses a fine brush to model the snow that caps the gray mountains at dawn. Red, white, turpentine. A sip of coffee, and then she's back on a train with Arthur, that honeymoon morning in Colorado. The mountain ridge fades into distance. White and more white, paler, paler pink. It blushes the sky just enough. His lips on her hand, her surprise. She had never imagined such beauty, and here was Arthur, her reason, her witness. Another tunnel, and the view is gone. But she has captured it here once again, as she will hundreds of times over dozens of years in the small white house in the small town, not quite alone. And uh, I want to just share one picture. This is a very important picture of my life. I grew up with this picture. She painted this when my dad was born in 1932. And this was kind of our talisman at home. There we were. We moved house almost every two years, all in the same town, like my whole youth. And that picture was, uh, was always with us. Um, and the picture, the book includes an infrastic poem based on that, which I'm going to skip over tonight at the time. But uh, that was a suggestion from one of my cousins who worked through this. He said, you should really explore that sort of thing further. Um, one of the pillars of the book is called Christmas Oranges, which is, um, <laughs> would you mind reading it? Some? We loved it. <laughs> the children were not to watch as father unloaded the snow capped wagon. Crates and bushels went straight to the cellar and under an Indian blanket. Father pocketed the key with a wink. Jenny had to sit to keep breathing, her hands trembling as she cracked the walnuts. That evening, candles clipped to the fur were lit, their dots of light graced the gingham bows, the popcorn strings and cast deep shadows in the parlor corners. Atop the white tablecloth brought from Ohio, turkey with stuffing, yams, and fruit pies crowded. The table so everyone ate standing or in the parlor. Mother fanned herself at the fire, exhausted, while Nora, the hired girl, hovered, hiding homesick tears. Family and friend neighbors joined in rolling up the rugs, then with fiddles and dancing, Jenny missed the beat. Stepping to the window, she gazed through the frosted panes. Stars arched over the prairie, horses stomped under their blankets. Father called her into the kitchen. I want you to see these first, Jenny. Remember? His carpenter's hands, deft and hard, cried a crate open. Golden spheres burned into view, sweet and strange. Oranges, she cried. Father laughed. They made the last train. She remembered from last year to peel them first. <laughs> <laughs> the flesh exploded in her mouth. Ocean, green, warm, sunshine. 
She closed her eyes and swallowed, not here in one taste. <laughs> she carried a bowl full into the parlor. The music stopped. The dancers paused. She beamed as everyone surrounded her, each reaching for an orange, the only one any of them would eat that year. The night froze in her memory like crystals on the panes, melting into a tale from time to time, like now for me, then freezing again for the next blue hour. Yeah, as Cindy said, it's kind of a moving time of year, and I've never been able to get through that poem, so thank you very much. <laughs> This is one of the few pictures of me with her. Um, this is a four-generation picture taken in 1957. Uh, I am in her lap, my dad and Esther. Uh, this is at Esther's house. You see the Jenny picture behind. There's always a Jenny picture behind in any of our family pictures. And this is Jenny on her 95th birthday in 1974 with another Jenny picture. She painted large landscapes for each of her three daughters, and this is the one she gave to Esther. So there's like one angle with that last picture, this is the other angle in the same room. So um, that's, uh, Jenny lived until 77, so we had 21 years together. And um, I kind of want to leave it there. I've been dipping around a lot and kind of giving a flavor for this story. Um, I'll be at, uh, I, and I really hope you enjoyed it. I'll be at the Q Willow Bookstore in Queens on uh, Friday. I'll be featuring at the um, Phoenix Reading Series in the Union Square on the 12th. And in April, I'm going out to Nebraska. We'll be doing uh, reading and events April 13th at the museum, uh, a couple of bookstores in Lincoln during that time, and so forth. So you can follow all of that at commodmedia.com. Um, we have a mail list sign up. If you're not getting emails already, please sign up. And if you do like the book or whatever you think of the book, please review it on Amazon. That's really important for the future life of the book. And uh, I want to thank Cindy for breaking up your singing voice and a wonderful <laughs> reading. And Pierce and Roxy and Matt and Tom and all of you for being here tonight. There are copies available and we'll be here for signing. But I'm really grateful to all of you and very excited. Questions? I mean, Bruce has already like sold the book, Lou has already left and went home. So, let's have any questions, please. I'll start. If you want, I'll start. Okay. You talked, Reese, you talked to me a little bit about all the emotions that are coming up. And um, I was just reading, has anyone listened to the Anderson Cooper's new podcast? No. I just read about it. There's a podcast and he's doing the same thing. He's going through things. So it was a funny story first, <laughs> all right? Well, um, let's see. Jenny wasn't, she was very warm, as you can tell. She wasn't really all that so we have a lack of sense of humor, kind of as a family trait on that side of the family. Good hands, can't tell jokes, you that sort of thing. Um, but I, I think the, there's a story in the book that I was really, uh, my dad was running around his hometown of Curtis, which is near Farnham, during the war, and these pilots were running, flying a military plane at this little base there, and they picked him up and uh, took him for a joyride around town, and Esther, with this clairvoyance she had, looked out the window and said, I know Don is in that plane up there. And there was one of many episodes in her life, uh, right after that picture of Jenny's 95th birthday, it was May of 74, Grandma had a weird feeling about me, Esther had a weird feeling about me, and four days later I rolled a car on a bridge, and utterly unscathed, but she had that presentiment about me. And I, I yelled at her, I said, if you've written me a letter, which we only communicated by letter, it was 100 miles, so we only <laughs> a letter. If you've written me a letter, would have gotten it in the mail that day, would have been careful making that turn. <laughs> 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 I should put all the blame on this poor, <laughs> poor grandma. Yeah. So. Any questions? Come on, guys. All right, go ahead. So, um, 
Did you find any uncomfortableness with your other members of your family that you were talking about these memories and these subjects? And if so, how did you deal with it? And yeah, yeah. Well, you know, as a gay man living in New York and having left Nebraska, partly because of that, there's a lot of material around this. But for this book, I really wanted to go with the show and be for the family. And so uh, you'll see in my next book what I can, what I can, you know from my work, what I, how I handle that. But I really wanted to stay focused on the years I knew, which were mostly the 60s when I was much too young to really know what I was doing in that world. And so um, there were some, there were not, so my relationship with them was always like just uh, kind of favorite child to these older women who were like the, the muses of my youth, really. You know, just, I spent my 60s running around the hills picking choke cherries and, you know, canning and doing all this stuff with these ladies. And they just kept telling me, telling me, telling me stories. So that's how I spent my 60s mostly. Um, but I, I didn't because I really wanted to focus on things they had told me and they were sharing. I know there are a lot of things that they, like the story of what happened in Ohio with this robber. It was just one of these, we don't, you know, we know that she came back on the rebound. Mm -hmm. It was bereft for a while. But the exact details in Ohio, who knows? But those were things that they, those were the sorts of things they were not going to tell too much about. And, and Ruth's problems with her brother-in-law when they went to Gillette, which is a big part of the thing, were also mentioned in covering, but not gone into. And Midwesterners don't go on those things. Does that answer your question? How did she sell her work? She sold it out of her living room, honest to God. But did she make appointments or did I, she made appointments? Her daughters, especially Ruth and Esther, who live nearby, were very active. Esther was a school teacher, her husband ran a general store, Ruth was a farm wife in every club in the county, and they were kind of her verbal network. Dorothy lived a little further away. Um, but she would, one, the, the most aggressive thing they did was they put the paintings in the drugstore window in Farnham, which is 174 now, but used to be about 500. And had a whole suite of stores that they oh, were in a big shadow of that. But so she put pictures in the drugstore, sold them, took the $10 from those pictures, went to the dentist and had her teeth pulled. Yeah. <laughs> this during the Depression? This was in the 60s. The 60s. 60s. So she started around 1940. So most of her commercial work, if you will, is from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So, okay, go ahead. I understand when you gathered her pictures for the, the museum and shows, you got them. The family, the extended family, have uh, probably 50 of her paintings. And uh, so we, they all sent me photos, and we gave them a selection of 20 of her pictures. And it's curious, because these are the pictures she gave wedding presents, birth presents, daughter presents. They're probably different from what she sold, but none of us have seen those. She's a bit on eBay, if you want to see how I know. But one of the things I think we might do in Lexington is have everyone in the area who owns a Jenny Hicks painting show up with a picture and then see what she's got. You know, because the, the difference between a sale and a giveaway, you know, is the ceramics. You give some things away, you hold on to others, and you sell the rest. Um, but she had customers in Hollywood, in California, and she was chipping pictures off of them all the time, and she eventually had pictures sold in Canada and the UK. And I think it's pretty important to remember that those 300 people who left Farnham all went somewhere else and came back. There's a huge network of Midwesterners, Nebraskans, all along the West Coast, lots of family traffic back and forth, networking through those family. She had lots of brothers and sisters on both sides of the family. And so I think it was just word of mouth. But there, and there's also no competition. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did she name that painting the elf in the play? No, did? I did. Okay. Did she name all her paintings? She never named her paintings. She signed them, and she dated a lot of them, but she never named them. Where did the lion painting live in your house? The rec room, the over the fireplace, my dad's office. You know, it, it just moved. My brother Kent has it now in the pavilion. Jay. How long was she able to paint? She stopped painting right around her 90th birthday. And that was about the time she left Farnham, um, her leather house. 
but she was getting, I mean, my, I remember my grandma coming by, Esther coming by to see, and she said, oh, mother, you're not covering the canvas anymore. You're going to have to be careful here. You know, it was just, her sight was failing and so forth. So I think that's kind of where it came to me. How much did she pay for the little white house? Oh, I have no idea. Well, I asked because I was listening. I was thinking, like, here's a woman, you know, he dies, farming accident, sells the farm, so there would have been. There would have been, if it was clear. Yeah. That, that was the problem. You know, That's true. Her husband, Arthur, was a very ambitious farmer. He was a champion of the shorthorn cow because it was both a milk cow and a beef cow. And uh, I think he took some leverage in the 20s. And, and you know, he lost at least one farm. And uh, so who knows what was left after that. The house uh, had no foundation. And uh, <coughs> she left, it was eventually torn down. Farnham is kind of dissolving before our eyes. So it's, this is a fire town. And do you have any advice for people who are brave enough to head down to their past, their family's past? And, um... I think, I think um, you know, the discovery for me that I share is pay close attention and try to remember and I dive into those memories, spend time with them because this book really blossomed. I think if Lynn McGee had not said, Bruce, there's something in Christmas oranges, keep with that story, you know, and I started making a list of the stories, but then it sort of just grew, and the memory will come back to you, and, uh, and people will, and I've heard more and more stories of uh, other family members that Lisa brought out, and another whole book could be written about from those perspectives. You know, families who had to leave the Depression moved to Seattle and, and became a family branch of the family there. So uh, just pay attention, and if you have older relatives, or for many of us, for your younger relatives, share your stories. You know, Grandma would, Esther, when she was in the nursing home, she'd sit there, what can I tell you? What can she just racking her brain to tell me one more thing about her past? Here's. Tell them about um, when your when Ruth was talking about how the weather had changed. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So these cousins from Seattle came back to Nebraska in 1986, and they were talking to Ruth, and I remember this so vividly. And they had left in the depths of the Depression, and none of them had good memories of Nebraska. And uh, one of them turned to Ruth and said, wow, it's so much greener than I remember it. And this is 1986. And Ruth said, well, since 1936, we've been getting decent rain. <laughs> We all laugh, but that's only 50 years, and just think back ourselves 50 years. That's not I mean, the, the invention of dreaded pivot irrigation. Yeah, changed a lot. It's too. changed the whole thing. All right, let me talk more about pivot irrigation. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, did Jenny ever talk to you about her paintings and did have any meaning specifically? Or I guess I also wonder do you have memories of? Um, her studio, of her painting, or any of those things. Um, because how old was she when you were born? She was. She was uh, in her seventies, mid seventies. So, so. so she would have been painting for another like fifteen or so. Yeah, she was right at the peak of her career mm -hmm. when I was born. Um, well, she never talked about it. I know she painted in a small room off of her mm -hmm. kitchen. Um, my older uh, member, my, my dad's generation, my cousin Arlene, remembers painting with her, and I know she loved painting with younger people, and she did that, but she never did that with me. Um, I would have loved that. But, um, and she treated it as her hobby. I mean, she never put herself out as an artist. And I want to be very frank, when she's making copies of images, because one of the images that's in the show is from an illustration used in National Geographic. But she was, so she was using her technique to make copies of things. And sometimes she would rearrange a mountainscape a little bit to get a culprit or something from a picture, out of the picture. But, uh, and once in a while she would be pretty abstract, uh, especially early on. But mostly she was there to really put together in oil form whatever she was working on, which was generally photographs. Um, picking up on that question, I'm fascinated by the great contrast between the landscapes that she painted and the landscapes that she lived, that she lived, lived in, the, you know, the spareness of, of the Great Plains. 
and and it's really really stare at Parnham Way. Um, you know that, that that's that's very minimal landscape, and people I think didn't understand the picturesque values of of, of grassland. And but did that ever come up? Like like you know this isn't um, these are not these are these are things that we can't see. Um, yeah. Well, I think she was painting what sold, and the demand was a, you know a picture over your couch. You know we want to, and this idea the aesthetics of prairies were very underdeveloped at that time. It's a trap in her diary where she talks about painting the landscape of the Platte River, which is near her, and which is now like a photographer's dream. Oh, there, there's huge, huge volumes of images of the Platte River now from an aesthetic point of view. But I've never seen that picture. I don't know what she did with it. Um, the, sod, the first painting she ever did, this one, she said, is based on a sod house in her area. So this is the closest I know she yeah. ever came to an actual landscape in that area. But this is a very treated Nebraska landscape. There's nothing as high as the hills in the back of this picture. Do you think this is water? I know. I would say it's probably a valley. Um, who do you who do you think changed? Who do you think started the appreciation of that prairie beauty in art? Well, I don't. I don't know about it, art exactly. I mean, that, that 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 sort of puts me on the spot a little bit. I, I know. I, I know. <laughs> in general, sort of culturally, I know. But park uh, national parks, for example, yeah. there were there were. Now, there were a couple of generations of official na national parks that were woodlands and mountains. Mm -hmm. but there weren't any grassland national parks until much later. Right. And, and um, but, you know, yeah, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, that's, that's a good question. You know, how, how did that evolve? Well, who's the, my, I'm having a moment, who's the Nebraska artist that was the first one to paint the so, but I'll find it. If anyone's interested, I will find it for you, and this work is beautiful. But it's that. It's it's definitely like abstract, but it's prairie and sunsets. So sunsets. One of the people who wrote a book for the book, Patty Campbell, Patty Scott Girl, is a Nebraska landscape painter, uh, and she paints what you see. She's right there. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Not, and not just from our standards of aesthetic, but she's found the beauty in that landscape in, in a really real way, which is the yeah. She's wonderful. She does it really well because yeah. she also doesn't idealize it. You know, no, a lot of, no, lot of landscape good. painting is, is very sentimentalized, and and, 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 and she, it's 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 aesthetically pleasing, but it's but it's but it's not sugary. No, it's, it's like Monet in Nebraska. I tell you, it, it really feels like those haystacks, and you know, it, it's very much like maybe Manet. Um, I have a friend here, and I was thinking about different ways that you um, can start digging into your family's past. And, and cookbooks are a very good way to do it, and recipes, and putting it together. And she put together, she and her sisters put together a cookbook with family stories and uh, the recipes, and that becomes something far more, another way yeah. of creativity. Although I never heard Jenny in all her writings ever talk about food. No, that's, <laughs> that's what she did. She baked bread. Yeah. But uh, you know, if there wasn't any camera in the garden, it was it wasn't no. the table. So no, this, this is what she this yeah. is what she did. Yeah. Anything else? Or will let me buy books. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you.